Good morning. May the living God bring incredible peace and joy into your life and into your home this morning. Welcome to Awake Us Now. I'm Pastor Dodge, and we're gathering this morning all around the country, and for that matter, around the world, to worship and praise the living God and to allow His Word and His Holy Spirit to speak directly into our lives. It is a joy to be with you today, and our God is a God who brings joy into the lives of those who follow Him, even in the toughest and most difficult of times. So we begin our worship this morning in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to whom belongs all praise and adoration today and throughout all eternity. Amen. I'd like to begin this morning with a word of Scripture, and it is a word that is quite ancient, 3,000 years old, but a word that speaks so powerfully and so directly to our day, to our lives, to me, and to you. Hear these words from King David, Psalm 61. It's a prayer, and we begin with this prayer together. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever, to take refuge in the shelter of your wings. Lord, that is the way we come before you this morning. Because you are our rock, our shelter, our strong deliverer, our tower of strength in the midst of the struggle against an unseen foe. We pray this morning that you would be honored and glorified in everything we say and do. We pray also and trust that you are going to speak into each one of our hearts and lives this morning. Expose those things, Lord, that are hidden, which need to be exposed. Minister to the deepest sorrows and wounds of our lives. Bring comfort and strength to those who are living in fear and bring joy to all of us as we call upon your name today. We pray it in the strong name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the hope of Israel, the Messiah, the Savior of the nations, and our returning King. To him be praise now and always. Amen. Amen. Our God is a faithful King. And today, our God is going to speak to us in a very powerful way from these final words of Jesus in his great Sermon on the Mount. For many weeks now, we have been taking a look, bit by bit, sometimes verse by verse, at this powerful message that Jesus spoke to his followers almost 2,000 years ago. Two millennia has not changed the incredible relevance of his words. Our God is a God whose words speak in every age and every generation. And I will tell you this right now, the words of Jesus we're going to be looking at today, Matthew 7, verses 24 to 29, are words that especially speak to you and me in this time, a time of uncertainty and confusion, a time of worry and fear, a time where many are wondering, how will all of this turn out? Jesus' words speak directly to us in times like this, and especially in this time. And so I would invite you to open your Bibles this morning with me, and uh, let's take a look at the final words Jesus spoke in this great Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 24. This is what we read. Jesus is talking, and he says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Jesus goes on, But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. Then Matthew writes, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, 
because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. He taught as one who had authority. Jesus said to his followers before he was taken up to heaven, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He speaks with divine authority. And we have seen that so clearly as we've been looking at his great sermon on the Mount. You know, when we read the Old Testament scriptures, the great Hebrew prophets frequently use this phrase. They say, thus says the Lord. Do you know in the entire New Testament, Jesus is never recorded as using that phrase. But he does use this phrase, in fact, frequently in his Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said long ago, but I tell you. The crowds recognize he spoke with authority. He speaks with authority today. Because these are not simply the words of a great teacher, a great moral leader, a great prophet. These are the very words of the living God come down to earth. All authority is given to him. And it is so important for you and me today as we consider these final words of his great sermon on the mount that we recognize he is speaking with that authority and it speaks directly to you and me today. And it is so important that we not only listen, but that we also respond. And so what I'd like to do today is go back to those words of Jesus. I recognize these final words of the Sermon on the Mount are some of the most familiar words from the Sermon on the Mount. If you have been a regular Bible reader or a regular church attender, or regular Bible study attender, you have probably heard and read these words on a number of occasions. That is really great. But one of the dangers of hearing something over and over is that sometimes familiarity breeds carelessness. And so what I'd like to do is carefully look at these words of Jesus. And the way we're going to approach that is we're going to begin by looking at words that are identical. And then we're going to look at words that contrast with one another. They're very different. And then we're going to look at one unique word. So with that in mind, let's take a look at what Jesus says. There are some identical phrases that Jesus uses here in the four concluding verses of his teaching. Verses 24 and 25, and then verses 26 and 27. In those verses... Jesus uses the same verbiage over and again. One of the things that he says both times as he uses these two analogies is, everyone who hears these words of mine. Now think about that for a second. Jesus is not speaking to people who are irreligious, is he? He is not speaking to someone who has turned away from God and walked away from his word. He's speaking to people who hear these words. In other words, he's speaking to church people or to people who call themselves believers or Christians or disciples. Everyone who hears these words of mine, Jesus uses that phrase in both of the analogies here at the end of Matthew 7. There's another phrase that Jesus uses, and that is, built his house. Everyone who hears his words, everyone who claims to be his follower, everyone who says, I believe in God, is building a house. Now, that doesn't mean that you are building a physical structure, although some of you may be. And if you're trying to build a house in the midst of this lockdown, may God have mercy on you and your family. But everyone builds a house in our lives. You see, what we do, what we believe, the way we live is building. We are building a lasting heritage Jesus says, everyone who hears his words builds a heritage. And the way he describes it is by using the analogy of two houses. Now, Jesus doesn't tell us what style they are. Are they colonial, split level, ranch, 
He, he doesn't go into those kinds of details. But from what he says, it appears that on the outside, the houses look the same. You know, Jesus taught that very thing. In fact, theologians often refer to that as the visible church. You know, people who claim to be believers, but only God knows the heart. Jesus says, anyone who hears his word is building a house. And the houses of two different types of people on the surface, on the outside, often look very much the same. Then he says this, the rain came down, the streams rose. In fact, if you look at the description that Jesus gives, it is a very lengthy one. He says, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And he says, it's true of both of the houses. The same phraseology, the winds blow, the rains come. The waters rise. The wind beats against the house. What is it talking about? It is talking about a storm. And dear friends, you and I are living in a storm today. We are living in a storm unlike anything any of us have ever experienced in our lifetimes. My parents went through the Great Depression and World War II. My grandparents went through World War I, the Great Depression, and World War II. But what we are going through right now is very unique. It truly is a world war as well. Not with troops on the front lines other than medical people and first responders and individuals who are making sure that food arrives at the proper places and is available for people to eat and the list goes on. But there is no warfare taking place in the sense of guns being fired and bombs exploding. However, we are in the midst of a storm and it is a war against an enemy that is unseen. What does a great storm do? It's the very thing Jesus spoke about. It exposes what goes down deep. A storm exposes what runs deep. And that is at the heart of Jesus' teaching here in these final words of his great Sermon on the Mount. The storm exposes things. We have looked at the phrases that are identical. Now, let's take a look at the phrases which are different. Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, and then he contrasts it with one who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them into practice. What Jesus is getting at here is it is one thing to hear what he is saying. It is another thing to live it. Jesus is not saying that we are saved because of what we do. He is saying that if we are saved, we will do. Real faith results in real living, true Christ-like living. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, Jesus says, is like a wise man. Who did what? Who built his house on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. Now, you do not have to have a history of work in construction to realize that a solid foundation is so important and so critical. And where you build is very, very essential. You want to build not on a flood plain, but on high ground. You want to build in good soil, not sand. Jesus says the wise individual builds on the rock. The foolish individual who hears his word, doesn't put it into practice, is in effect building on sand. And what happens when the storm comes and when the storm ends? The house built on the rock is standing, but the house that was built on sand has collapsed. <laughs>
Do you understand, my dear friends, how important, how fundamental, and how essential this teaching of Jesus is? What he is saying to you and me is that the storm of life reveals where and how and upon what we have built. The storm is raging right now, dear friends. How are you holding up in the midst of the storm? Because if you have heard his words but are not putting them into practice, then chances are very good. What's going to happen is this storm is going to expose the folly of that kind of a lifestyle. On the other hand, if you have built solidly, hearing his word and putting them into practice, even the storm will not destroy. Because, well, there's a unique phrase Jesus uses. Look carefully at Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 and 25 and 26 and 27. The words are very, very similar and then uniquely different. But there is one phrase that is used only once. And that is that the house that was built by the wise man did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Because it had its foundation on the rock. And so the natural question is, what is the rock? What is the rock on which we are called to build? What is the rock that will enable you and me to weather any storm, and this storm in particular? And there, the testimony of the scripture is very clear. Jesus is applying a word, a term, that is used throughout the Bible. It is used time and time again, beginning in the book of Genesis, continuing through the Torah of Moses, going in through the great writings of the uh, Hebrew prophets and the Psalms, and in the New Testament as well. That word, the rock, has a very distinctive and powerful meaning. Here are just a few examples. If you've got your Bibles, take a look. First of all, Genesis 49, verse 24. This is uh, at the very end of the life of Jacob, who is named Israel by God, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And before Jacob died, he gathered his sons around him to pronounce prophetic blessings over them. When he came to Joseph, he spoke of the fact that Joseph is one who, even though he had been attacked, had stood strong. Why? Because, verse 24 of Genesis 49, because the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, your father's God. Who is the rock? The rock is God. Who is the rock? He is the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, the psalmist wrote. And Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on what? On the rock. And it continues throughout the scriptures. First Samuel chapter two, verse two. This is in the great prayer of Hannah, who had gone for years unable to conceive and cried out to God saying, oh Lord, please let me have a child and I will dedicate that child to you. And God heard her prayer, granted her a son, Samuel, who became one of the great prophets and leaders of ancient Israel. This is what Hannah prayed after the Lord answered her prayer. She said, there is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God who is the rock. It is the living God who hears the cries of his children, who answers in miraculous ways, who delivers them out of difficulty and trial, who can be depended upon in every situation, every circumstance. And yes, every storm. King David wrote about that. 
Psalm 95, verse 1. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. God is the rock. Jesus, his name means God's salvation. God saves. He is our salvation. He is our rock. And he can be trusted in any day, and particularly in this one, in my life, in your life, in the lives of our loved ones, in the lives of all who call on his name. Isaiah 26, verse 4, the prophet Isaiah was given these words. He said, trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord himself is the rock eternal the rock that will not be chipped away, the rock that will not crumble, the rock that will not be destroyed, the rock that stands firm even in the greatest of storms. And finally, the apostle Paul spoke of this truth as well. Paul was a rabbi, a devout Jewish believer, a Pharisee among Pharisees, an individual who was firmly committed to the Hebrew scriptures. And the Apostle Paul knew these words and knew them well. But he would go on to write this. He said of his ancestors, the Israelites, when they were in the wilderness at the time of Moses, he says, they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. What does it mean to build on the rock? And the answer is to not only know about Jesus, but to know him. To not only know about the Bible, but to know its author. To not only know about God's will, but to practice it. To not only know about the teachings of scripture, but to demonstrate them in one's life to not only know that God is love, but to reflect that love in our lives and to those around us, to not only know that God saves and that Jesus freely took the abuse of the creation that had rebelled against him, and that's us, to not only know that, but to understand that we too now, walking in his steps, as the apostle Peter tells us, are too Pray for those who persecute us, to turn the other cheek, to love even our enemies, and to forgive those who have deeply wounded and hurt us. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, Jesus says, is like a wise man who has built his house on the rock. And that rock is the living God. And dear friends, at a time like this, you and I especially need to rely upon him. At a time like this, we especially need to hear these words of Jesus, these closing words of his sermon, because he is pleading with each of us to not only hear his words, but to put them into practice. What does the storm do? The storm exposes that which is often hidden but which is most valuable and most important. And if a person's life is built on sand, the storm will destroy everything that's been built. But if our lives are built on the rock of the living God, the storm, oh, it can be vicious and wicked, but the foundation remains and we can depend and rely upon him The picture that Jesus used is a dramatic one. I believe it is also a prophetic one. Because you see, one of the questions we need to ask ourselves today is, what will be exposed when this storm ends? What will the family of God look like? What we've seen over the last 20 years is the number of people in America, the percentage of people in America who truly are walking faithfully with the Lord Jesus is going downhill quickly. Many followers of Jesus throw up their hands in despair at that. And they say, if only the world would listen. But the fact of the matter is, dear friends, the world will not listen unless the children and people of God are living as Jesus said, putting his words into practice. 
What have we seen in the Sermon on the Mount? He calls us to repentance. He calls us to deep humility. He calls us to a wholehearted commitment to him, a wholehearted commitment to the living God. He calls us to put into practice in our daily lives a radical Christianity, not mere religion, not simply lip service, but rather self-sacrificing faith that transforms lives and calls people even in the midst, I should say, especially in the midst of the greatest storms to realize that God alone can deliver us and God alone is our help and our hope. What will be exposed when this storm comes to an end? When will the storm come to an end? What I believe the Lord Jesus is telling us is right now, we're to be on our knees. We're to be humble before him. We are to seek him with all our hearts. We are to pray as never before. We are to pray for our country. We are to pray for the world. We are to pray for revival and awakening. We are, we are God's messengers to this earth. And in the midst of the storm, if the people of God are not anchored on the strong and firm foundation, the world itself will be the worse for it. We are the hope of the world because Jesus is the hope of the world. And he calls you and me to take him seriously as never before, to follow him with a whole heart, with deep and total commitment. That involves humility. It involves faith. It involves faithfulness. It involves prayer. It involves searching the scriptures. It involves practicing what we believe, sharing with our loved ones, sharing with our friends, sharing even with our enemies. And that, dear friends, changes things. Revival throughout history has not begun with unbelievers. It has begun with believers who suddenly realize how great, how mighty, how powerful, how dependable, how loving, how faithful, how good is our God. And as the prayers of God's people rise, God responds. And he calls you and me to take this seriously. Rock or sand, what's it gonna be? There's only one wise choice, and that's the rock that is higher than I. The words we began with here this morning, Psalm 61, the rock that is higher than I, greater than I, more wonderful than I could ever imagine, more dependable than I could ever ask, more faithful than I could ever conceive, more forgiving than I could ever deserve, and more loving than I could ever dream. He is good. He is God. And he is the rock, the rock of our salvation, the rock of our hope, the solid rock on whom we build, the rock that will not be shaken. Even when the world around us is shaking and rattling in the storm. Amen. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, our God, we cry out to you. We are thankful for your incredible faithfulness. We are thankful that you are good, that you are God. We thank you for thankful that you keep your word. We pray, Lord, that you would raise up among your people a growing body of believers who are people of prayer, people of obedience, holiness, faithfulness, people who cling to the Lord with all our heart, and do not lean on our own understanding. We pray, Lord, for our nation and for the nations of the world. We pray that as the family of God is awakened in this time of storm, the world would listen as never before, that lives would be changed and transformed, that people would return to the living God, that individuals would experience your powerful and miraculous healing your deliverance, your great work 
in hearts and lives that can alone heal the deepest and most lasting of wounds. We pray this in the strong name of our Lord Jesus. And we pledge before you, Lord, in our prayer that we will not only hear these words of Jesus, but we will put them into practice. Amen. Amen. Well, dear friends, God's word is not something to be merely heard. It is something to be discussed and lived. And one of the great things about discussing it is it encourages us to live it even more. I'd like to uh, share with you just a few things that might get some conversation started in your home, wherever you are. Uh, if you're with a family member or with a friend, if you are living with your roommate, whatever the case may be, or if you're all by yourself, you can still talk about these things to God. <laughs> and what is your life's foundation? I, that's a question all of us need to ask, and regularly. What is your life's foundation? How is the current storm affecting you? Is it driving you closer to God? And if not, why not? Why do you think Jesus emphasizes putting his teaching into practice? And what does that mean for you? You see, it is important for us to not only hear, but to respond. And I pray that all of us will respond in ways that that truly will be life-changing because our God is a life-changer and he is life.